Just let me know. Yeah? Okay. Hi. Uh, <coughs> good afternoon. My name is Vishal Tarsana. I work with uh, Semantic uh, as a software security analyst for the product security group. The uh, topic that I'm going to talk on today is essentially security requirements in Agile PLC. PLC is product life cycle. And there is a reason why I have named it as practical navigational aid for speedboats. Okay. Uh, we'll take questions uh, maybe towards the end. Okay. Uh, this work is actually going to go into something known as safe code. It's essentially a software assurance forum for excellence in code. And this is a community initiative, so of which Semantic is a uh, Semantic act actively uh, contributes to that as well. Uh, for more information, you can go to safecode.org. All right. Okay. <coughs> so I'm going to open the problem statement. If you see this guy, he's he's probably heading one of the product. Teams, okay, without taking any name per se. This is the question which teams had when they are transitioning from waterfall model or any of the conventional software development models to Agile or uh, any of the similar more early feedback kind of models. Okay? So the question that hits this person is how do I fit my security requirements in a Agile lifestyle? The reason this is important is what I'm going to talk next. This is the uh, <coughs> way I'm going to explain what we have done. Right? So <coughs> I'll talk about what ships and speedboats are in the PLC world. Right? Then we'll talk about what are the navigational aids. Again, this is with respect to product security. Uh, then we'll talk about the solution approach. Okay? And then we'll talk about the solution details, as in what, what work was done. Okay? So <coughs> ships with respect to PLC is nothing but, in this case I'm referring to the uh, age-old waterfall method, right? which has this concept of requirements gathering and then you're doing this uh, analysis, the design, implementation, testing, deployment, and so on and so forth, right? On the other hand, in case of speedboats, I trust everybody knows what speedboats are, yeah? Okay, speedboats are the, short, uh, the smaller version, the ships are the big ones, right? So in case speedboats, with respect to PLC, is the Agile method, okay? Now, here are some of the features of Agile. I'm just giving a brief uh, intro, just in case you're not, or just in case you haven't come across uh, Agile yet. So it's an early feedback mechanism, right? You have uh, the concept of Scrum teams. Uh, this is very specific to semantic. At your organization, you might be implementing Agile using a different method. Okay? But here we have the concept of Scrum teams, which are essentially cross-functional. So you might have a Scrum team which has six or seven uh, people, and all of them are from different roles. So you'll have developers, you'll have designers, you'll have QA, you'll have the project manager, all sitting on the same team. Okay? Then you have the concept of sprints. So as the name suggests, sprints are typically two to four weeks. Okay? Uh, the intent or the goal is to come up with potentially shippable increment expected at the end of each sprint. Okay? Now, what happens is, when I say navigational aids, <coughs> in case of ships, security requirements are very detailed in each phase. So whether you're dealing with design phase, whether you're dealing with development phase, whether you're dealing with the testing phase, or what, what, whatever, whichever phase you're talking about, the requirements are extremely detailed. So what I mean by that, So if you look through, the, if uh, look to this slide, this is called seminized. This is an internal name for semantic. It's essentially uh, 
putting security in the development life cycle. So we call it semi semantic immunize, right? You see this <coughs> right from concept to sustenance. There are these bunch of security activities that are supposed to be done, right? And whether it is training or goals or risk assessment or penetration test, first test, whatever may, uh, any of these activities could be there, right? In a typical <coughs> waterfall, okay, let me get the mouse. <coughs> so, in a typical waterfall, these requirements could last anywhere from six months all the way up till a couple of years. So it's not surprising for those of you who uh, have had a chance to work on the development life cycle, you might have come across this where uh, the duration of the entire uh, release cycle could be all the way up to two to three years and could be as less as six months. Now in the agile world, six months is a lot. Right? When you have two to four weeks to give one increment, then what happens is detailed security requirements for each phase don't work. Okay? There are no distinct phases. Right? So it's an early feedback. If I'm designing something, I'm quickly going to put it to uh, implementation. And at the same time, my testing team is ready to give me an early feedback. Right? The turnaround time is way too short okay? to adhere to detailed security requirements. <coughs> so we identified this problem. It actually came as a request from one of the product teams that we were working with. And what we said, okay, hey, we have this set of detailed security requirements. Why not try to translate them? Right? Just see if we can translate them uh, effectively to the agile. Right? So we started uh, looking at a list of existing requirements. Now since uh, conventionally most of the teams at Semantic were at Waterfall, so we had these set of existing requirements. So we started looking at them. Now around the same time, which is uh, last year, November, November 2009, Microsoft published uh, the SDL log, which is the Security Development Lifecycle. Right? Uh, I mentioned this here. Part of this doc actually detailed uh, an approach which could be taken to address agile security requirements. Right? So there were four categories that they mentioned. They said, hey, there are certain tasks that you can do every sprint. There are certain tasks that you can do one time. Right? I'm, I'm going to explain what that means. There are certain tasks which can be put in a bucket and there are the requirements for very risky code. Right? Fair enough. So we said, okay, let's take a look at this as well. Now, we were thinking of using it as it is. Because why reinvent the wheel, isn't it? I mean, you have, you've had some uh, brains which have gone into this uh, document from Microsoft. So hey, let's try and use it as it is. We wanted to do that, but realized that these are some of the areas where we could so, uh, customize it or improve it or adapt it to our requirements. So there were things that we identified such as there were new tasks in various categories which were not in the list. Okay? There were multiple tasks which could be folded into a single base category, uh, which could be applied for multiple development platforms. So there is a lot of non-Microsoft uh, code that Teams at Semantic also develop, right? So even they, they need those requirements. Then there were some tasks that needed help from security experts. So I, I'm going to take a quick example. For instance, it's very easy to go to a product team and say, hey, you need to do threat modeling. What do they do? How do they go about it? Like first few iterations is when they would need help, isn't it? You can't just tell them, well, you need to do it, otherwise we're going to fly. That's not going to happen. Okay? And 
towards the end of the presentation i'm going to uh, discuss how we help the product teams do the same thing okay then there were many tasks which had the potential to be further broken down okay so uh, based on these things we decided to uh, adapt the document and that's basically what i'm uh, going to discuss next any questions this far no okay So based on the adaptation, we came up with six categories of security requirements. Now, uh, the names have been detailed. Uh, as you will see uh, from the parent Microsoft SDL document, uh, for three of the categories, the names have been retained. Again, by the invent if, if, it, if it's making sense, right? So every sprint essentially details the requirements which have to be met in every sprint, no matter what. Okay? I'll just show you what it looks like. Uh, the intent of this talk is not to walk you through an Excel sheet. So I'm not going to discuss each and every requirement in detail. I'll just pick up the significant ones. Uh, just so that, so that it helps you decide whether this is something you would like to use or you would like to adapt further. Okay. So if you see the first one, this is how we laid out the sheet. Right? So here, in the initial document, which we picked, or uh, the initial list that we picked up from Microsoft, we had up till column E. Okay. So you had this is the actual requirement, and the, uh, there are there are these three columns whether it applies to online services, managed code, or native code, right? So we said uh, for our analysis. We decided to not consider that. So we took each requirement and saw whether it would fit our uh, in our environment, semantics environment, or not. Okay. So for instance, threat modeling. I just touched upon that. It is very easy to say that do a detailed baseline threat modeling for the entire product. In agile environment, there is no concept of a uh, baseline threat model for the entire product. Because you're doing things one feature at a time. So you have one feature which you're going to accomplish in let's say 10 sprints, right? And you need to figure out how to do threat models for that. So we said, okay, hey, how about if we say create and update threat models for new features? Okay. Now, what we did here as an example, we said also include the tasks in very risky code. Tab. Because that, that's a tab which I'm going to discuss shortly. Uh, we, we improvised on that tab as well. Okay. Then we say, uh, then we decide uh, split this further by saying whether it's a requirement or a recommendation for new code, for existing code, or whether it requires a human intervention. Okay. So as in whether it is a requirement or a recommendation for a product team. And the last column which you see, column I, is the one where we have tried to uh, analyze the benefits or the uh, uh, limitations of doing so. Does that make sense? You guys with me? Yeah? Okay. Alright. <clears throat> the categories that you see in blue are the ones where, remember how I mentioned that we folded a bunch of these categories into base task list. The one that you see here in blue are those ones. Okay. So, for example, I'll take a quick one. Let's say if you see this, don't use banned or risky APIs. But I have another favorite one actually, which is environment runtime and compiler requirements. Okay. Now, what we realized that in the initial SDL uh, document uh, from Microsoft. We realized that all these were listed as separate requirements and they were across multiple categories. Picked them up, folded them into one base category. So now, <coughs> depending on what environment you have, let's say you have a Linux environment, right? So you are more than welcome to add here. So the list itself is not task constraint. Okay? So for example, I'll just ex expand that. 
So there are these, uh, what, three, four, about seven, eight of them which we have folded into one base category. So you set things like compile all code with GS compiler all the way up to link all code with the uh, slash safe SEH linker. Okay? Or for that matter, if you look at this last one, this is also base category. Resolution of issues identified by static code analysis tools for new code. See, one of the things which teams struggle with is that when you run these static uh, code analyzers, there is this next step of uh, looking through what has been flagged. So the analysis of the false positives have to be identified before you actually go to work on the issues. Right? So he says, okay, how about this? Instead of saying the resolve everything that has been flagged, let's say, by a static code analyzer, we say, okay, wait a second, why don't you resolve the issues identified for new code at the very least? Again, this is agile. Okay. Okay. Now, the bucket requirements. given a brief description here. Bucket requirements, again, this is retained. The description of the buckets has been retained from uh, Microsoft SDL document. It's essentially, you have a bunch of buckets, <laughs> right? And you pick up one task, right? One task for each bucket in a given sprint. So let's say for a given feature, you want, you decided to have 10 sprints, right? You take sprint number one, come to the bucket here. So they are important, but they are not uh, as important as the every sprint uh, tasks. Right? So what you do is you go to each of these buckets and you pick one task from each of the bucket and do it in that sprint. Okay? So here also what we realized is that there is a security verification bucket. Most of those verification tasks could, have, could be folded into that. And we identified certain new tasks as well. Right? So if you look through the uh, description, it says conduct, uh, conduct verification sprints. Uh, you have verification bucket items. So we say it, you do it at least thrice in a product's life cycle. Okay. So these are a bunch of them which got folded. So you disable tra tracing, you have you do binary analysis, you can do in-depth manual code review, so on and so forth. Okay. Then there is another bucket for design tasks, right? And the third one this response tasks is, is the bucket which we uh, modified significantly because one of the things that uh, I'm sure you guys would have seen is that when you have when you're developing or working on a product there is a lot of tendency to use third party components. And those third party could be maybe internal to your organization, right? Or it could be a completely different third party product, right? So in which case, you need to keep track of the patches or fixes to the third party dependencies, right? Or keep track to the OS components for that matter. So the underlying OS might be going through a spate of Per se, right? You need to have that listed as a separate requirement. So that, this is what we uh, identified and uh, if you see in column I we have given the reason why we identified. Okay. okay, then we have something called one time requirements. Okay. Again, this is uh, every sprint bucket and one time have been retained as it is from the Microsoft SDL document. So one time is essentially you do it once per project. Okay? And typically there is no need for repetition. So one, one favorite example I have is you designate a full-time security program manager. Yes. 
typically at the beginning. Uh, the only thing is that this is uh, the category which allows for a little bit of lag time, uh, which is let's say if I look at this second one, right? You designate a full-time security program manager. Maybe finding one or identifying one with the right set of skills is it's not something that you can do in one day, right? So you get a little bit of lag time, but you need to do it. So and you're right. So typically most of them are supposed to be done at the beginning itself. Right? Or for the, this matter, let's say configure bug tracking to track the cause and effect. So once you have that flag on, or once you have this mechanism, you're done. Right? Okay. This very risky code was also uh, listed. We have picked it up from uh, the document itself, but we have expanded it further. And if you remember, in the every sprint uh, category, the very first item I talked about was threat models, right? Update threat models for new features. That's where we are recommending, or we have recommended that take this before you start threat modeling. So when you're working with a team, uh, or when a team is doing threat modeling, have, they should be considering these things. The reason this is called very risky code is because at the time of writing, it's it's typically if you look at the nature of code, it's networking components, ActiveX controls, Windows services, Unix daemons, so on and so forth. Right? So these things are actually, or for that matter, code listening on unauthenticated network ports uh, connections. Right? Or you might have code that is interacting with the uh, uh, traditional C, C++ uh, uh, components. Right? So th these kind of things need uh, greater scrutiny. So we've come uh, Yes, go ahead. So typically, if you were to uh, map it, what you would do is, when you're doing threat models, keep this in mind. I'm not, I'm not saying keep only this in mind, right? So the, you do keep this in mind, and when you come to the bucket requirements, in, under the verification bucket, you make sure that these were actually agreed. So now you've covered both ends. It's not just like you said, okay, we should be doing that, and you forgot. So yes, there is a bit of a redundancy in that. Yes. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. So as you can see, all these are requirements straight away. There is no question of recommendation as such. Is one of the one of the other things is that typically these become the entry points for attacks. You know, you might have built a very 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 strong fort. But maybe the entrance to the fort itself isn't guarded properly. Everything else is, you know, so. Then this is a new one that, which we added. This category is called help from security experts. Okay. So we identified a bunch of tasks uh, such as there are these uh, 12 specific tasks, at least as many. It always has this improvement, uh, I mean, scope for adding yes. No, I was asking what kind of work for filmmaking, what are you using? What? For filmmaking? Yes. We are using the. Uh, the SL? Yes. The filmmaking tool. Filmmaking tool, yeah. Okay. Even for the DFDs, actually. I use it all the time. <laughs> Find it very convenient. Okay. So. <coughs> As I touched upon this, you have creating a baseline threat model. Help the teams. Let, in our case, as an example, we uh, try to model it on Stripe, which is uh, Microsoft uh, recommendation. We, can, we, we find it to be pretty okay, as in it, it works, it's fast, you know. But help the teams do that, you know. Or conduct penetration tests on the product. How do you expect the QA uh, team uh, within 
a given product team to do a pen test on their own. At least not for the first few times, right? You need to help them understand this concept of security test cases. How do you write these test cases? It's just that they are anyway doing it at the functional level. They just need to turn, turn or switch. Things like third party security assurance, which I've already touched upon. Uh, there are certain tool recommendations. There are lots and lots of tools out there. Which ones to use? Which are the ones which will give me better results? Why? You know? Or you have prioritization of issues identified by the uh, static analysis. This is one of the uh, key things where we have uh, seen a lot of positive response from those whom we have helped with this. So as an example, uh, we use Covert, which is a static code analyzer. Right? So it, the run gets executed, there are a bunch of issues that get reported. Right? Now the team would love to do things with it, but the team is on agenda. Within four weeks or within three weeks, they have to deliver something. They would like to fix some of the key issues. Problem is they don't know how to approach it. So we help them with prioritization. Or in case of .NET code, we use uh, this FX Corp. Right? FX Corp gives a bunch of uh, uh, flags. Right? Again, there is a small in-house strategy that we have come up with to help teams to prioritize. Instead of saying, hey, it has flagged like X number of issues, fix all of them. They will, they will never be able to do it, you know, even if they want. Is this making sense? This one? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. That's within Visual Studio, yes. Yeah. Yes. And when you say helping the developer team, I mean, you guys are like um, mandatory or like a consulting service that the developer team can request for help or all that works? Good question. I will be discussing that. Okay. Yes. And there are these bunch of requirements which we found that as of day for the for semantic environment, uh, they would not apply that as much. So we have sort of separated them into for future consideration category. Okay. So for example, uh, most of the products which semantic has had uh, up until a few years back have not been web enabled, right? In fact, web as such has just matured in the past decade or so, right? So a requirement saying that fix all the issues identified by analysis, static analysis tools for web development does not necessarily apply to semantic products as on the Now, it could apply to your environment, right? So again, as I said, this is not a uh, list cast in stone, it has this scope for adding things based on your environment, windows, non-windows, whatever it is. Whatever we have done is based strictly on semantic product environment. Okay. So now what we did is that, oops. Once we had these uh, six categories in place, we went back to the teams which were uh, planning on transitioning to Agile, right? Or who were doing Agile for the first time. And the response we got was very, very motivating. Because people realized that the moment we tell them, that, hey, listen, you need to make sure that your every sprint requirements at the very least are adhered to, that helps the project manager very uh, specifically. Right? And the moment you give that flexibility, then okay, hey, in certain cases we are saying it's a recommendation, in certain cases we are saying it's a requirement, you see which one fits your environment, that gets the point across versus coming as a cop. Okay. Any questions thus far? Does this, does this make sense? Okay. Good. So the same way was there in the beginning. Now his thought process has changed. So we've helped him change that. Now he's considering that, hey, should I evaluate this work for my agile environment? And when I say this work, I'm referring to the work that we just discussed. Right? So at least in his mind, we've changed the question. Okay? 
Okay. Now, I am not going to uh, try and sell what we have done. I will give you certain pointers as to how we have done it and you can choose what you want to do. Okay. So, in other words, is this list actually practical? Now, how we help product teams? We have this concept of embedding. Uh, one of the speakers yesterday, I think he's not here today, his name is Matt from Gotham Digital Science. Yeah, he, he, he left this morning. Okay. So, he had incidentally or ironically, he had touched upon this in one of his slides that uh, because I believe he also talked about security in the SPS, right? But he was coming from a business angle completely. So he did touch upon embedding portion that hey, uh, how about if you actually embed these security requirements into the uh, product life cycle, right? So what we did, we do physical embedding. What I mean by that, I am part of the product security team, right? For a given period, 3 months, 6 months, 1 year, I would work intricately with a given product team to change the culture uh, or to help them become more security aware. So for example, we would do things like these for them. You remember that category, security experts to help? So those are the kind of things that we, we do with them. And we do a transfer of information. So if I have helped them with a covariety analysis, right, which is a static code analysis, after a while or in their second run or, or their third run, they don't need me. So I have helped them sort of become self-reliant on that track. And it has already got into their process, right? Same thing with threat models. So you help them once you keep, you uh, get the concept of BFDs and stride in place, help them, okay, hey, this is the associated risk, this is what we recommend, and this is why we recommend it. Next time onwards, they don't absolutely need you. Or maybe two iterations, three iterations. Okay. Another thing which is in progress as we speak is that this work has, is, has already been uh, circulated to the teams in Semantic, few teams in Semantic who are on Agile. Okay? And there is a, the pilot runs are actually in progress as we speak. So we'll see how that goes but again so far the response has been positive. Okay? Another thing to note is that when we came up with this concept of base task list, this was the main reason for it. That you can actually add language specific requirements. So you are not bound by just the categories uh, wondering, okay, if I had a different environment, what do I do? Okay. So in other words, or in short, is this list practical? Yes. Should you use it? You decide. Given as much information as I could from my side to tell you what we have done to uh, put it in practice, which is the reason the uh, title of the talk was Practical Navigational Aid for Speed Codes. Okay. Any questions so far? So you are from Mandatory, from from where I come from. You are like a services, but after a while, like an internal consulting service. Okay. Yes. The only difference is the. Uh, very intense because we uh, we get to work at the uh, I mean with the developers and the QA and the management and all that. Now we are for example we are mandatory like the same thing we are mandatory so products have to use us. Okay. And they can also request more help for different things. But we have like a list of mandatory things. Okay. And then they can for all the things they can request for services. Okay. And also we for example when you say we're embedding you said you were teaching the 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 product thing and after a while you are ready for them, pretty much. We, we don't actually. When we are sending you a security skirt, it's for life. Oh, no. Maybe the security skirt will change because people change the or whatever. But you always have like a security skirt working, security expert working with that, with that product. Okay. So then that's slightly different than what we do in the sense we try to sort of do the transfer of information. We don't want to be with a certain team for life. No, we, we, what we do is we keep them, we train them, we give them that like a So what uh, what we end 
of doing is that after a while, once there is significant maturity, then we function as external consultants. So let's say uh, uh, people here, let's say you are part of a product team, and let's say you are from the management, from development, from QA, and there are certain tasks which have been explained. Right? Once that is done, uh, you, one amongst you or someone amongst you, once, once you have identified a security expert, that expert can always consult with the product security team. Okay? So yes, the, the prime reference for this work, uh, as, as I mentioned at the beginning, is the SDL document, which is the so, uh, security development lifecycle document from Microsoft. Then of course, Waterfall and Ajay. Uh, thank you. Yes. So the, the, the question of whether I want to adopt this, it seems like you saw Study done by the Ponemon Institute. Okay, you may have come across this. Um, I think this was in July or August, right? And they actually ended up talking to uh, a bunch of big U.S. multinationals, right? And what they spoke to them about was what is the cost of security fix, right? And you'll be amazed that the number was. $17,296 per day. So, if you can avoid a security issue by putting things in place when you are developing things, right? This is a cost which you will get hit once you are in the market and a vulnerability comes. So, that debate always is there, right? That, hey, why should I do it? I'll just take care of it in case an issue comes later. We'll just work on it. People get into a huddle mode. Your entire teams have, are then occupied with this security hot fix, you know. Versus one thing I'm, uh, which we have seen, um, correct me if I'm wrong or if you guys have observed something different, is that if you can identify things at the design stage, for example, if you have done threat models diligently and taken actions, you can save a lot of, lot of effort if something gets discovered later. Because first of all, you have anyway eliminated most of the potential issues. So yes, if that figure helps you, then yes, you have $17,296 per day uh, of effort which will get saved in case you were to get hit. So imagine if, if a fix took you, if a fix took your team, let's say two sprints, and each sprint was four weeks, right? So you can do the maths. So 17,000 into some per day into uh, eight weeks would be roughly like some, uh, what, uh, 30, 40 days. So you can, you can just do the maths, you'll find that the number will be actually interesting. And that's, that's another thing that we have started doing. Uh, as, as technical people, we have the tendency, or, or assuming that most of the people in this room are technical, we do have the tendency to say that, hey, you need to fix it because this is a technical defect. Why don't you get it? Okay. And sometimes, it just helps to approach things from a business viewpoint. I think the keynote speaker yesterday had touched upon that, that there is that people aspect as well. And or, or if, if only we could approach things from that angle, it would make things much easier. And that we have seen that in practice. So there is this concept of cost of not fixing an identified issue versus cost of fixing an identified issue. And every time you do a cost benefit analysis, you always find that the cost of not fixing an issue right, is always greater than cost of actually fixing an issue. The cycles that, is, that it takes and so on. Does that address your question? Yeah? Okay. Anything else or any other questions? Can you talk about how Symantec specifically decided to do the first round? Is it after Microsoft and Cisco launched their overhaul or was there an incident? Oh, no. Uh, there wasn't a trigger per se. There wasn't an external. 
external trigger. Uh, Symantec has had internal security requirements for a long time. This one slide which I showed on Simunize, that is actually Symantec's internal immunization for the development lifecycle. So that's been there for a while. And as I mentioned, um, we did get a request for adapting those set of requirements to the agile world. And that was a new baby for us at that time. Right? So, it, ironically or incidentally, right around that time we uh, came across the SDL document. So, initially the thought was, we will take the SDL document, we will take our requirements, we will merge the two. Right? And that's, that's essentially how things start. And then, this work that you see that actually got evolved as we started analyzing and we said, okay, wait a minute, even this is not complete, this is not complete, let's, let's put this, let's move that out, you know, let's add that in. What are the other things that we see? You know? So that's how this actually came about. Yeah. Okay, uh, I guess I'm done. Thank you. Thanks. Hmm? Uh, okay, how did I do on time?